Okay, we're recording. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Seidel. As promised, I'm here with my friend, D Danielle Johnson Webb, who is going to uh, help me have a dialogue today about some topics that have been saturating our homes, uh, our office, the media, coupled with the pandemic and a lot of space of tension and energy and learning. Um, and I really am hoping that this will be an opportunity for you all to just witness a dialogue between the two of us on the limitations that people who don't have color are just um, missing as we raise our children. And, oh, are you there? Okay, good. I'm here. Um, so many of my parents are asking me what we can do. What can we do, you know? And uh, I'm, it took us a while to connect. I think I told all of you that um, I was supposed to meet with her last week. And I'm so grateful I had this time in the middle because the things I thought I was going to ask her, I've spent so much time learning this week. And I recognize now that asking Danielle what I should do is not her job. Um, but I do want to um, just have an opportunity to listen. I want to hear your perspective, Danielle, on um, what our children are witnessing and ways in which I can help our families create an environment of more tolerance. So um, I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you for taking. Thank me. you. Thank you so much for having me. And I think, you know, this is, this is important work, especially um, in your field, right? I think, you know, I, I met with a colleague and, um, you know, we were meeting about, you know, how do we feel in this moment in time? And I, I feel like she said it best where she feels like for her entire life, she's been trying to tell people there's a monster under her bed. And everyone's like, there's no monster. There's really no monster. Now everyone's like, there's a monster. And, you know, she's, we've been saying this. And, and you know, when you're, I, I can speak from the Black perspective. I mean, that's, that's this perspective that I, I will have to take because that's when the skin that I live in, live in every day. And, um, you know, we have had to be so intentional our entire life survive and that is everything you know that is our doctor that's our dentist that's our psychologist right um we have to be very thoughtful i can't just go to a doctor and say hey you know i'm excited to be here i have to ask what books are you reading what research have you done on black bodies what research have you done on black racial trauma um because i need to know that you know that before you can even give me care right because that that is going to affect me i have a friend um who is a professor at upenn and, and he right now is doing a study on kidney disease um, and African-American people and how that disease progresses with the added layer of racial trauma, right? I mean, there's evidence of that, that racial trauma really does affect our bodies. And so I'm just grateful that you're having me. I think this is very important, um, especially, especially in your field, um, because, you know, there's a lot of evidence um, that even medically, you know, we haven't always been treated well. Um, so I just wanted to thank you and, and put that out there. But, you know, I've been thinking about this question a lot and, you know, what can people do? I, I have worked in a world, um, I've been in the education world. I'm, I've normally been in, in independent schools where, you know, historically those structures were built during desegregation. They were built for white flight. And so I've never been in denial about that. Um, and, I, and there's probably some degree of that now. Right. I think we all have to be honest about that. But I think about young people um, and when I think about especially young white males and white privilege, um, you know, white women haven't really stood up. Right. Because we I can't say we but in my opinion, you know, white women are the ones giving the values to their children. Um, and I'm not saying that dads are not present, but I do think there's something about a mother and even, you know, it, no matter what your background is. Um, and, you know, we have many, many young white students that have been socialized with racist, racist tendencies, not on purpose, right? But this world has been built for them. And so, right. you know, oh, oh, sorry, are you, okay. I was just gonna say, you know, I have all these parents who have said to me, you know, like, um, I, I, I guess the question is like, what is the cost of raising nice kids, right? So, so many of the parents, I, you know, I raise kids that don't see color and that are so nice and kind and tolerant. And what, what happens is, is that I think that in, in homes, when we raise children to like everybody and not see people as differently, independent of the messages they're getting from their parents that they don't realize, that um, we never have a conversation at home about race that right. is relevant, right? 
Right. And I think that term, you know, I think for a long time, time I think the term I don't see color is so dangerous, right? Because if you don't see color, you don't see me. Right. I think that's what, that's what you're speaking about, that, you know, what is kindness? Kindness is seeing people. Kindness is recognizing people's differences and respecting those differences. And if we act like there are none, then who do they grow up to be when they're older, right? It's this this feeling of, oh, slavery's over, right? We We don't see color. We like everyone. So you have no, right. there's been no harm committed against you. And so I think that's, that's incredibly dangerous. I have a set of friends, um, white friends who are raising um, young white boys and they've been intentional since the moment they were born. Um, they're intentional about the newspapers that come in their house, the books that come in their house, what their kids are able to see on TV. Um, and really having a discussion about race early. Um, I, a friend of mine, her son is in a local preschool and they were intentional about the preschool. And yes, they're three, but they had an entire talk about Black Lives Matter. And yep. he came home at three at the dinner table talking about Black Lives Matter and white privilege and you can start that young right we i also think that you can start consent culture that young right what does consent mean we can we should be starting that at one, 18 months right if you don't feel comfortable hugging someone you don't have to hug right and so i think there's so many moments we've missed or that white parents have missed because it's safer to say i'm raising kind kids we don't see color we accept everyone and if that's the case you know i want you to scroll through your facebook photo i want you to look at your wedding photo Right. So this right. is right, right, right. Like I didn't even have like a list of black friends to call. Right. It's just horrible. And this reminds me of the most hilarious story that I just remembered. I'm so embarrassed to tell the story that I'm going to tell it anyway. So my daughter wanted to go to the American girl store, the American girl doll store in doll store. Chicago because they didn't have one close to us. We went to Chicago for a, a trip for me. And I took her to the store. And when we got to the store, she picked out an African-American doll. And I'm so happy with myself. I got my daughter. She doesn't see color. And I just realized this very moment that um, I didn't take that as an opportunity to teach her, right? When you look at the books that are in your home as a young parent, are your books all white? Are they colored? Are they faith? Are they faith dimensions? You know, like, is there a place in your home for your children to learn outside? Right. You know, you have to be intentional with that, right? Absolutely. You have to be intentional about it. I mean, everything, right? I, th I think I said, you know, the movies they watch, the magazines they read, the books they read. And if, you know, they're never learning about people outside of whiteness, right? I think that's a problem. I think also, historically, we've never talked about whiteness as a race. I think that's a mistake, right? Like, that again. white people are allowed to be allies. We've, we've never talked about whiteness as a race. Um, and I think that's been a huge mistake, right? Um, because that also gives some sort of superior, like we all have to deal with our race, but white people are allies, right? And um, I think that that can also be very dangerous, right? Because we allow white people in those ally spaces and they haven't done the work, right? But because you say I'm an ally, I voted for Barack Obama, I gave a little money, I'm an ally, but no, you have to do some deep, deep work. Um, and you know, I've surrounded my people, I've surrounded myself by people my whole life that have done intentional work. It's so important for me, right? Because I need to know that if we are ever in a situation where we're out, that you will stand by me and you will stand with me and hopefully stand in front of me, um, if that makes sense. One thing that I think is such a powerful um, comment to that is that um, I really do feel like when you make an when you have an opportunity to really connect with someone who's other, whatever that looks like to you, it's really hard to have an energy of fear or hate when you can make it personal and make mm -hmm. a connection with someone who you know, right? So mm -hmm. I feel too like... Um, but I, can I interject on that? Yes. I do. I think that is, I do think that's, to a certain extent, that is true. Um, but remember, I've grown up in an all-white world where I've, I've had to get to know, like I've had to get to know pe white people. Um, and I think white people are able to navigate a world where they don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where it becomes, you know, we need to have the personal relationship and the person. That's a lot of weight on me when there's so much work you could do without me, right? That would, that would welcome me into your world. I mean, we can tell, I mean, I speak to, to I come from a long line of, of PhDs and um, you know, I was taught from a young age, we can really tell white people that have been socialized with black people. Mm -hmm. I can tell it immediately because there's so many, so many nonverbal cues you give me when you're not comfortable around. What does that look like? What does that look like? That's an interesting, you know, some of the research that I'm looking into right now is the trauma of working with white women. Um, and I think that, you know, 
I have been in situations with bosses where they'll tense up if I come around the corner or, um, you know, we're second guessed at everything, right? I feel like even when you look at black actors, they have to be able to dance and sing and do gymnastics and swim and like, you can't just be an actor. You can't just be a Brad Pitt. They can just act. No, you have to be Denzel who can sing and he can dance and he can tap, right? We always have to have more, um, and, but we're still questioned, right? It's still this questioning. I think when you navigate spaces where you can never feel safe to just know what you know, um, you get that feeling as well, if that makes sense. What do you notice in the children that you work with um, in your career and how that um, manifests? Like, I, I think there's this thought that, you know, that, that anti-racism is, is taught, that racism is taught, that creating an environment it begins just from the very beginning that you discussed. But I just wonder what that starts to look like in children as they age and how, um, how parents can be intentional about um, I don't really know what my question is. I guess I'm not asking it really well. I just want to know like what it's like for the kids that you see in elementary school and in middle school and in high school, what it's like for them. So that my parents who think um, their kids are being really tolerant or they are, um, or they're teaching them just to be kind to everyone, what are they not seeing from the lens of our, our black children? I think it goes down to those nonverbal cues, right? I think children are, are you know, having a high EQ. I think, you know, schools perpetuate a lot of things, right? Where, um, you know, I think sometimes, let's just say a racial slur is used, a school is going to use that as a teaching moment, not realizing that the person who received that slur has been highly affected, right? But because they're young and they're developing, you know, we need to teach them. And, and I think for a lot of Black people, especially, it's like, well, why? They're 14. What has happened in the last 14 years that they didn't know that wasn't okay? Um, but I also will say in this moment, um, it's been hard to find hope. I'll be very honest. I think that this moment is an awakening for white people, but we have been screaming for years that this is going on. Um, but we are surrounded by some very, very, um, some, I'm surrounded by some young white people that give me a lot of hope um, because they are pushing limits. They are pushing against their parents. They are trying to educate their parents. Um, but if you continue to allow your child to navigate this world as just a white privileged young person, I mean, that's damaging. So, so is that when what I, doing is teaching, is getting into our schools and teaching to go from the bottom up? Because like, absolutely. You, yeah. You're ne they're never too, I think there's always a, oh, they're too young to handle this material, right? Um, I know a lot of schools are processing the George Floyd. How young do you, you know, talk about that? Well, Black children get to talk when they're four before they go to kindergarten. Right, our innocence is stolen, but we continually protect white innocence, right? They're too young to hear this message. They're too young. Oh, it's too violent. My mother had, to, I, I was never raised that the police would protect me. I don't want the police coming to my house. I don't feel comfortable when the police are around. I don't feel a sense of like, oh, I'm safe. I've never felt that way because I couldn't be taught that in order to survive, right? And so I think if we allow these young white children, if you're not questioning why your children's friend base is all white, if you're not questioning, you know, when you look at your child's social media page, everything is white, if you're not questioning that, there's a problem there, right? And I think we really, because I'm, we can't navigate, the, there's just no way I could navigate the, that, the world that way, right? And so I think we have to be very intentional in those moments of, oh, you're throwing a birthday, but it's interesting about it, 15 people and they're all white. You, you don't go to an all white school. like. It's not that you have to invite who you don't want to, but let's have a conversation of why the 15 children look this way. And I think that's probably very hard when you're a parent, um, but it's very necessary. I remember sitting in a training years ago to school that I was at and the diversity trainer, you know, said, raise your hand if you've had a person of color in your house in the last three years that you did not employ. And I was the only one that raised my hand. Yeah. Children see that. The only person of color that comes to your house is, you know, who might be cleaning it or who might be cutting your yard. You were sending a message, right? I was raised around Black doctors and surgeons and lawyers and, right, I saw Black excellence. But if you only take your child to white doctors and white psychologists and white dentists and white, like, if you're not intentional to find people outside of your whiteness, yeah. I mean, what are you, like, what are we doing? I just, so I think we have to, it's those little moments. Yeah, that's so good. And I, I want to just reiterate what you said before, because the discomfort is so critical, right? Black people have been uncomfortable for a really long time. Forever. Forever. And 
forever. And all of our, uh, so many of the conversations are around, let's just wait to have that conversation when it gets more comfortable. And by the time they, our parents have these kinds of conversations, we've already modeled so many unintentional or intentional, like, choices and things that are our priorities and people that we surround ourselves with that then right. we're undoing things right right we're absolutely and then i think there's also sometimes that easier moment of i'll let the school do it but yes. sometimes when that happens basically what you're saying is i'm gonna let the students of color in a school do it right and that's 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 a lot that's a lot of weight and if you think about that you know if we're waiting to have these conversations how much trauma is happening in the meantime Right. So much, so much trauma. Um, and so messages from some, you know, we always talk about in our families, how we want to sort of cr help create a narrative in our homes. That's like um, an opportunity to teach us, our kids what we know. And at the same time that, and, and while that can be really amazing, because we can sort of teach our kids about sexuality and teach our kids about um, when it's time to be intimate and teach our kids about kindness and faith and whatever. Um, it also is so constricted, right? And then, um, and it's scary, I think, for some parents to sort of put that out there and let someone else be in charge of the narrative, right? Right, absolutely. And so I think we just have to, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, it's messy work, it's hard work. Um, I'm, you know, I can't say that I'm not glad that we're in this moment. I'm, I'm horrified that we had to get here with a police officer putting his knee on someone's neck for eight minutes and 43 seconds, right? But we still see the injustices of that. If you, the first autopsy that came out, it was that, it was a force and pre-existing conditions. I'm like, right. yeah, but, right? And so we still see the injustices. Yes, and, and it's so rich too. And I know this, again, I don't want to make this about more than, you know, just sort of creating an environment for my families. But I will say it's so rich that now that there are all these protests, you know, many white leaders and, and people in the community are saying, this is too much. Why don't you just, just do a peaceful protest? But when someone took a knee in 2016, that wasn't, you know, that was, right. that was also too much. Like, it's just, it's and, so and, to get that. Yes. And, you know, I think it's easy to, to, to sit in the looting and the, the rioting, but we are sitting on looted land. Black people were looted from Africa. Like, we learned this from some, we didn't start the looting, right? And so I think it's always convenient for white people to be like, oh, but the looting, and, the, and I'm not saying that I agree with the looting. I'm not saying I agree with the rioting. But what I do know is that people have been screaming for years and no one has listened. And so, you know, I think we have young people right now, which that I'm terrified for, I'll be honest, with COVID going on and I see other people out there and they're not six feet apart and they don't have masks, you know, I'm terrified in, in, from that view. But these young people are angry right? They are angry. They have a different voice than we had, I think, because of social media, right? They know a lot more than we did in terms of, of, of justice at that age. Um, and so I think they're angry. And so, you know, I met with a group of, of eighth graders who um, were processing this, and they started down the looting and the, the rioting, and I was watching the other adults not step in, right? And I think it was kind of like, oh, how do we, right? And we have to step in. And I, I share with them, I'm at Carolina Beach right now sitting on looted land. I saw um, Chief Seattle's great great niece week in Seattle this year. He gave the entire city of Seattle, and to this day, their family has received sixty-four dollars. But we're going to talk about looting and protesting, right? We have tribes that have we've taken everything from them, and so, you know, I think it's really convenient when we when we pick and choose, you know, when things need to be peaceful and when they don't. Um, and and I think for my parents, you know, my biggest the biggest obstacle that um, I hear from families and from um, and from friends and even from my own child who tried to explain to me about a week ago how you know she just she didn't she doesn't understand you know like I, she thinks everyone should just be equal like she sees her friends at school that she's chosen that have all different colors what's the problem and I think that they're there does need to be a space where we recognize that we're not making it different enough. Right. And I think also it's great to have, you know, a diverse set of friends. It's great to have a diverse set of colleagues, but what work are you doing to ensure when you all sit down at a table together, that the table's equitable. Right. And I think that's where, you know, universities are diversifying, but uh, when everyone, the leadership team sits around the table, is there an equal voice, right? Is there an equitable voice? And I think that is, to me the most important you can i say all the time right you could you could have children you could adopt children that are of a different race if you haven't done any anti-racist work doesn't mean you're 
you know, not anti-racist because you adopted two young children that are of a different race than you, right? You still have to do the work. What do you talk, what are you telling the students that you work with? Are you just in a space of listening to their pain or their, or where they are? Like, what are you telling students when you are the school or when you are exposed to them from a leadership standpoint, Mm -hmm. when their environments at home um, are confusing for them? Have you had that conversation? So I've, I've had it in multiple schools that I've been in. I do feel fortunate of the school that I'm in right now because I do think, um, we have a, a set of very forward thinking young people, um, a large group of them. I'm not saying that there's still not a lot of work to be done. Um, but right now, you know, my my energy right now is on the black and brown students and really, yes, listening, listening to that pain um, and, and list, just allowing them to have a voice and be heard. Um, and I, I feel like my entire, you know, school is doing that right now, which is hard, right? It's hard to sometimes sit back and and, and take the feedback and, you know, you work really hard to make a safe place for children and, and we don't always do that. Um, but I think, you know, we have a set of young people who are gonna push us, um, you know, black, white, Asian American, Indian subcontinent, Muslim, they're gonna push us and they have been pushing us. And I think that's why the institution I'm in right now has progressed so far um, because these young people hold us accountable. And I think that's where I go back to that hope piece. Um, but there's still work to be done. What is the best thing to say to someone in your life that's black or someone who you want to connect with like i was in the office yesterday and i had a patient who i adore and i i just i got very tearful and i just said i'm so sorry like i don't know what else to say but i'm so sorry and i don't think that was the right thing to say right i said i'm listening i want you to know i'm here to amplify i i want to say the language that that feels heard and i just think so many of us really so many of the people who i care for really do want to do the right thing and they just we're just not right. And I just wanna know what's the most helpful thing to hear. So I think that's hard, right? Cause I think it's a mixed bag, I'll be honest. Most of my black male friends don't want anyone to like, they're like, where have you been? Right, yeah. like. They're angry. Where were you with Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice? I mean, there's been a whole standard, there's been a whole, and before that, right? Um, you know, I do wanna hear from peop- my white friends. And if I haven't heard from you, I'm questioning things, right? And, and it's just as simple as how are you doing, right? Because I think for me, the emotional trauma of navigating this world every day for my 38 years has been exhausting, right? Um, and, and to me, there is some like, I get something from my white friend saying, you know, how are you doing? I'm checking in, right? And I also think because of my line of work, I'm not, um, I do think I, sometimes I want people to ask, you know, how can I help? Because I feel like I have an expertise where I can share that. Um, but I think when people aren't in my field, they're kind of like, you can, if you wanted to learn how to knit, you'd go to Pinterest, right? Like there's a whole set of resources, right, that you could find. So um, I think that's a hard one um, because I think a lot of people are in very different places about that. Um, but for me personally, you know, I do want people to check in. And if you're not, right, I'm wondering, where, where are you? Um, so uh, here's the thing i i don't think everyone's going to get everything right i don't think everything you say is always going to be right and, and because people need different things um but as simple as what do you what do you need from me yeah. right um what do you need from me and and for me it's you know i had a colleague call today not a colleague but a friend call me today and say you know what do you need from me and she has a very high powered position um at one of the top um, universities in the country and i said your whole you have 22 people on your leadership team and they're all white you're not holding anybody accountable, right? One of the top institutions in the world that is spending tons of money to bring in diverse students, 22 people that sit on the leadership team are white. And, and you all are discussing this and figuring out how to communicate. How are you doing that if you don't have any people of color sitting around that table? So for me, um, if you are in a privileged position, you have the power to hire people. And I walk into your place of business and it's all white that's telling me a story, right? And so to me, like, do that. Start with what you can affect change on. Um, Use your privilege to call your colleagues out when you see things aren't going right. Um, You know, and demand things. If you you run a business, you know, I have a friend who does consulting work and she's working with, um, she's getting a phone call. Honest, three weeks ago, there was no money for for her in terms of racial equity work and now there's a ton of money available. Um, But she's working with uh, one of the biggest hair companies in the country that really services white women. Um, and, you know, she's working on equity work, 
with that group, right? It's so because that group employs so many people, affect change that way. Why isn't equity work mandatory? Even if your clientele is all white, like think how many people you can make an impression on and, and really, uh, you know, change a set of, of thinking and, and like, we have to do that. Right. And I remember talking about, I love my doctor. I will tell you, my doctor is absolutely amazing. When I moved to Charlotte, I drove back here for my doctor. I've had her for many years, but she's a white woman. And we had to have a really, really hard conversation a couple of years ago of what are you reading? What do you know about my body? Right. And, and I mean, there's evidence to show that when you, you know, they've, they've done um, studies on EMT um, people who will save a white person first, right? That comes like, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, woo, woo, and now I'm going to a doctor, like, if I fell out on the white, like, who are you saving? There's only one AED machine, like, so I need to know that you're aware. Um, so to me, it's that awareness and really buckling down and, and putting in a set of policies that are equitable, right? You can have, things have to be equitable. They just, they have to be. And so if you have people of color that work for you and they have to go through five white people to make a complaint, not really equitable right um and so how do you create an environment that is welcoming to everyone yeah it starts from the bottom you know and from the and from the top you know i think too i just really want i guess what i want my parents um who are really uh moving through all this to just consider this another layer in your dialogue um, about um, listening you know, uh, 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 with each other and another opportunity just to listen. You know, I want our kids to grow up in a world um, that really respects all different kinds of people, but that's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen because we show everybody, you know what, everybody's the same. We're not all the same. We all have our own stories and part of healing this, this really big, really big wound is listening. So, yeah. And I think, you know, listening, educating yourself, um, you know, there's a ton of books out there that people can read, White Fragility, Me and White Supremacy is an excellent read, yes. um, because I think, you know, you got to do the work, we all have to do the work, there's work I have to do, you know, everyone has bias, if you take the Harvard bias test, we all have it, um, but my bias isn't going to affect as many people as yours might, if that makes sense. Well, for all my patients, I'm going to be putting uh, another list of both movies and books that I actually got all by myself. So um, that will be an opportunity for you to continue this conversation at home. Educate yourselves. Reach out and ask how your friends are. And also what I'm hearing is just really listening without any energy back. There's really not any conversation necessarily that has to come back of explanation. I can feel as we're talking, like thinking I want to speak and then just noticing I just don't want to speak, you know? And, and, I think, and I think that goes to, you know, I'm a firm believer in the space we take up, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important right now, and I think it's been important, but for white people not to take up a ton of space. Yeah. Um, and to listen, I think you're, you're right on. It's, it's that listening piece and, and education. We have to educate ourselves. And I think also, you know, I don't use the word ally. I use the word accomplice or co-conspirator, right? Because I need someone who's going to go into war with me, right? I need someone when I can't speak up or when you see me put into a situation where it might not be safe for me to speak up, I need you to speak up. Yeah. Um, you know, you think about the killing of George Floyd. If there had not been a camera there, I don't know. Right. And so I'm not, I don't want anybody to put themselves in a dangerous situation, but I have friends right now in Durham, North Carolina, white friends that when they see a cop that just pulled over a black person, a person of color, not even a black person, a Latinx person, they, they pull over. Yeah. I can't, I can't do that. Right. I'm not willing to put myself in that position, but if you have the privilege to, I have friends, now I'm not saying because situations get very dangerous, but like, it's those little things. If you're in a grocery store and you see someone talking to someone in a way, step in, right? Yeah. Like let's step up and step in. Yeah. I think it's it's really time for that. I know your time is so valuable. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking some of it with me. I just want my families to have a little bit of energy and, and know that our practice in general is really, you know, we've been quiet too long. There's just a lot still to say. And so I am going to use my privilege to amplify everybody's voice and to speak up where I can. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Can, I, can I mention one more thing that just came to mind? Yeah. When, I, when I'm thinking about COVID, um, you know, it's really affecting the Black community and, and they're saying it's, you know, due to pre-existing conditions, you know, that's systemic racism, right? When we look at the medical care that Black 
Americans have been given um, and hasn't been great. Or if we look at, um, you know, the distrust. There's many Black people who do not trust going to the doctor, and you can see many reasons of why that is. And so I think even when you're having a talk about COVID um, and the people that are dying from that, it's not just because people don't want to be healthy or don't know how to be healthy. There has been a system built against them to not be healthy. And so those, like that's an easy dinner dinner table conversation. Yeah, that is good. That's so, so good, especially when we're all getting ready to get back into things as the numbers start to rise. Well, enjoy your vacation time. Your quiet Thank you. Time. Thank you, Danielle, so much for taking Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, bye.